curious. But in the traditions of Islamic spirituality, in Ifan and, and Tasawwuf, this is actually very important. The halal that you eat, the wara with which you eat it, the adab with which you consume it, your attitude to the food, historically in Islamic civilization, hugely important. Get your attitude right to the most fundamental source of your subsistence, and the other things will come easily. But if you're somebody who uh, stuffs himself, and it doesn't mean overeating, but kind of somebody who is gluttonous, even with a small amount of food, um, then you've already missed out. And he says that these uh, consequences will arise from it. And of course, in our time, one of the difficulties of trying to make sense of this kind of traditional spirituality is that these things have become virtues. Most of the traditional vices have really been inverted to become public virtues, celebrated by the mass media. Why? Because uh, there's so much energy that human beings generate in following these things. People really like to eat. People really like sex. People really like showing off. And there's so much human power in those things. If you can harness that for commercial reasons, then you've got it made. You've really got it made. And so increasingly, every year, these two things seem to be kind of taking over everything else. If you look at the supplements of the New York Times 50 years ago, and you look at them now, very interesting to see how the amount of stuff on food has endlessly proliferated. Not just nice recipes for cheesecake, but endless stuff on the new restaurants and the nouveau cuisine and uh, drink as well has become not just the preserve of a small number of epicures, but it's just part of public culture. People really fuss about what they eat and drink, and they have to have this kind of tea and that sort of wine, and it's important to people's sense of self. We've become extraordinarily fussy, and a lot of people are making a lot of money out of that fussiness. And the other thing, of course, is the physical desire, which again, if you can commercialize it, means you've got it made not just Hugh Hefner, but much of the industry of today's world. You go into a newsagent and you see pretty faces on the majority of the covers of, of the magazines. Why? Because whoever she is, she's making money for some media mogul. And this is something that we have to uh, push back against, I think. And the fact that the modern world is focusing on these two things in particular is really a proof of what Imam al-Ghazali is saying that these are the fundaments these are, this is the basis from which all else flows get these things right and the other things will become easier for you don't eat too much, don't be obsessed about food don't fuss about what's being put in front of you um, and then on the desire thing don't desire this or imagine that or wish this or the other but just be content with what Allah has given you if you get those two things right you will find the rest of deen really becomes a lot easier but if you're still kind of into certain elemental biological desires beyond that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in his generosity given you um, then the, the consequences will be apparent so it seems like a startling and a curious way to start and this discussion of ethics is all of these other vices flow from these two things but if we think about it in our culture unfortunately this is where we are and we'll talk a bit about the second of these uh, shahwatain next time inshallah but um, uh, at the moment what Imam Ghazali does is to shock us with something which is an aspect of the sunnah that we really really don't want to think about too much you know, there's big Islamic conferences where everybody's talking about maqasid al-shari'a or something. And lunchtime, and they all head for the buffet in the Seven Star Hotel in Abu somewhere. And there you can see it's a serious business. Uh, where is that in terms of the maqasid al-shari'a or the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? we don't really like to think about that and even on a rehla like this we can complain that oh, the food is cold and blah blah this is nothing to do with deen the way of people of deen is to be delighted that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you anything at all all you need is a few luqaymat 
few morsels which will keep your back straight. That's all the metabolism really needs. We're not designed biologically to have to eat in a five-star restaurant, really. We're designed biologically to be living on a mountainside and occasionally to eat the leg of a sheep or to eat vegetables. That's what is good for us. And this new thing is uh, an aberration, a perversion. So, alhamdulillah, luqaymat really should be sufficient. Um, but the way of the Holy Prophet وسلم, and those who say that they are following the way of the Salaf are not always terribly conspicuous in following this particular dimension of it, unfortunately. And uh, there are too many preachers who yell at us about us not following the Sunnah who can hardly waddle up the minbar because of all of the buffets at those conferences on Sharia. Unfortunately, and it, it is a fact in Allah Yakrahul Habra Samin, the Holy Prophet says Allah dislikes the fat religious leader, the kind of there's some people metabolically though like that. But this kind of it's uh disturbing. Uh and the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam shows us the alternative. Um his is a way of fakr, his is a way of zuhud. His is a way of not really being very interested in a whole lot of food, which is even harder to imagine. I really wanted that extra chocolate, but mashallah, I've, I'm getting ready for Ramadan, and I said no, and <laughs> this is my spiritual good deed for the day. And mashallah, if you take that, you know, that's something you'll be rewarded for. But not to be so interested in the first place is the higher degree and the better degree, and takes us closer to the qina'ah. Of, of the Anbiya alayhim salam, the contentedness. So the Imam then smacks us with this chapter, Bayan of Fadilatil Ju'i wa Dhammu Shabal, an exposition of the merit of hunger and condemning eating one's fill. Mm, oh dear, we just had dinner. Um, but he's making a significant point here. As, as as we'll see, and we don't have time for the whole exposition, but the experience of people traveling inward paths throughout history has always been fasting really helps, not eating too much really helps, and thirdly, not being inwardly attached, the kind of beast within that leaps up when it sees the possibility of eating something. Uh, that beast is not really what we are and has to be stamped on. It really has to be stamped on. The ultimate destination, as he makes it clear later on in this book, yeah. is not an apathy to food and drink. Neither is it overdoing it and getting fat. Instead, it's the maqam of shukr, being grateful for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided but being so wrapped up in other things that you're not really terribly interested in that additional chocolate. Generally, people eat to excess out of anxiety or out of uh, a desire to forget something or for the, sake, for the sake of comfort or out of fear. There are many reasons why people have these disorders and nowadays we are disorderly even uh, in something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us in such a beautiful balance because the human metabolism knows when it's hungry and it knows when it's had enough there's a kind of inward light that comes on saying well that was kind of enough and the rest would be kind of save it for later but we're so unbalanced we don't even know the most fundamental fitri signs that our own bodies have feeding to us, so that um, we have eating disorders and we have dieting disorders. I once tried to explain to somebody from Malawi what diet Pepsi was. <laughs> Very difficult. There, of course, you needed food, you ate, and having Pepsi that didn't have something that might make you bigger was inconceivable. They just didn't see the point of that. But now, this is where we are, because instead of that inner balance taking over, um, we need external 
uh, checks and balances. So I need to drink something that tastes sweet, but I'm going to have Diet Pepsi instead because the inner regulation is no longer there. And the consequences of this, and this I think does confirm Imam al-Ghazali's surprising emphasis on the centrality of this, is that the disorder of the modern world in large measure is due to gluttony. Not so much if you're looking at, say, the environmental crisis of the other things like lust. It's to do with gluttony. We eat too much and that means industrialized agriculture and overfishing and the things that are really threatening the planet. The fact that coal may run out seems to be less worrying than the fact that you can't get cod for your fish and chips at a reasonable price any longer in England. That's what's really worrying. And why is that? Alani's generosity has given us this amazing blue globe full of things to eat and we can he commands us to eat these things halal and tayyib but because of our imbalance because of a human race which is in the grip of moguls who are making money out of our gluttony we're just um, munching too much eating for comfort snacking gobbling um, meeting for cakes and Starbucks and having an extra it's not necessary and it's destroying the planet and everybody can see that modern agricultural techniques and the mega fertilizer industries that are required to keep it going uh, are destroying the planet which is indicative of the fact that we're not khulafat any longer we're a kind of parasitical principle that is taking the life from the life support system, like the flea that kills the organism that it's sucking the blood of which, of, which is not what a parasite is supposed to do. We're worse than parasites because we're killing the, the mother organism. That's the reality. And the news that came out just two weeks ago about the catastrophe of um, fish stocks in the Atlantic and the Pacific, things are apparently much worse than we feared. Um, even if we stop completely now fishing, which of course there's no chance that we'll do, most species will require 70 or 80 years to uh, replenish. Um, we've had it, we've blown it. But um, the moguls who are making money out of our gluttony don't really think about the crisis that will certainly hit us 30 or 40 years down the line. Um, instead, they're just concerned with the next 10 or 15 years because usually they're in their 60s and they just want to retire to the Florida Keys and who cares what happens in 2040. Even people don't think much about what they're handing on to their children any longer because in a meritocratic world, who knows who's going to be running the corporation in 2040. So it's a dangerous situation and it is, I think, ultimately about we just like food and drink too much. The world food crisis could be solved by abolishing the world alcohol industry. In some parts of Europe, a third of, of farmland is used for the production of uh, materials for alcohol production. Drinking beer and drinking wine, of course you could use those grapes and barley and stuff for producing food, but instead they don't. That's part of the problem. Other, the other problem, of course, is that we just... Uh, are snacking ourselves to death. It makes us sick, makes the planet sick. It's an imbalance. Allah has already given us metabolically the awareness of what we should eat, what we shouldn't eat, um, but we've just blown it. And this is a deep sickness. And unfortunately, in the Muslim world, things are not really better, I would say. You go out of the Bab Abdul Aziz in Mecca from the Haram, having seen the Kaaba itself, the great symbol of Allah's infinity, you turn around and you go outside the Bab Abdul Aziz and there is the world's biggest branch of KFC. The Saudi teenagers kind of stuffing. Um, that's how we are. So we can't really moralize on this. We're part of that, um, part of that world as well. But we need to be uh, leading the charge against this commodification and commercialization of something that Allah has created for us as something halal and tayyib and over which some of the most beautiful human adab uh, exist. Um, the act of sharing food, of providing food, of offering food. Again, the buffet doesn't supply that. Who knows what happens to the stuff that doesn't get eaten at the buffet. Um, they just provide you with more than you need. 
and we've all been to, at least many of us have been to those Islamic seminars where they're in some swanky Gulf hotel and you're at, everything is kind of gold and chandeliers and waiters hovering and, and there's a table for the seminar and there's hardly any place to put your papers because there's three glasses for the fruit juice and then there's a plate of sweets and then there's a bowl of croissants and then there's you can hardly see the person you're supposed to be <laughs> engaging with in the seminar because there's all of this stuff that you'll never be able to eat um, well this is the ummah unfortunately that's why the chapters like this are really scary and that's why in our traditional love for the holy prophet and we tend to emphasize this issue of his jaw of his hunger he was the one whose hunger was so great that he would tie a flat stone to his belly out of hunger. And he was Sayyid al you know, the Lord of the two worlds. And this was his maqam. That's why religion is dangerous, because that kind of talk subverts the whole consumer process. For an ideal, a perfect human being, a role model, to be routinely hungry and to change the world upsets all of the conventional wisdoms. It's one of the most challenging aspects of the seerah of the Chosen One, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al faqru fakhri, al faqru fakhri, demadimi, alim lejin fakhri, fakhru na zikret, fakhru na zikret, mahfu fenada, bulda bugunlum. Hajjabayram Valley, who we mentioned earlier, has this famous, famous ilahi, um, which has the verse on this uh, particular aspect, this, this fadil of the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Poverty is my pride, poverty is my pride. Did he not say this? He who is of all the world, the pride. Remember his poverty, remember his poverty. My heart has been melted in mahu and fana, in nothingness. The contemplation of the poverty and the hunger of the Holy Prophet is spiritually hugely beneficial. It really is. The sacrifices that he made when he could have been Lord of Quraysh, uh, which he made for us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, unimaginable yet we complain when the buffet is cold or when the mufti of somewhere has grabbed all the lamb chops and this is <laughs> this is the state of, of our ummah uh, salam so he hits us with this chapter